The diner was packed. Mr. Chrome was waiting in a back booth when I arrived and waved me over as I came in. I'd spent the last few weeks researching the prison, the same thing I'd been doing for the previous year, but now it was more of an eye towards strange occurrences. Stragview had its share of unnatural deaths and odd disappearances, but the prison seemed to be good at covering them up. I'd been excited to talk with Chromes again, and his story had made me reach out to some of the others I'd been hesitant to talk to. There was a real story here. I just had to put it together. I'd wanted to speak to Chromes again, but it had been almost two weeks since I'd managed to get in touch with him. He sounded nervous when he spoke to me, unsure about our next meeting, but sure that it had to happen. Chrome had something to say, and he wouldn't be bullied out of saying it. Mr. Chrome had set himself near the back wall, the front door in full view. The place was full enough that we would be hard to eavesdrop on, and harder still to pick out of a crowd. The waitress ambled over, and I ordered some food. Mr. Chromes waved me off when I offered to pay for his meal, just holding out his coffee cup for the waitress to refill. He took a sip before turning back to me, savoring the dark liquid. So, I see I didn't scare you off. Seems like you might have been the one that got spooked. Did you worry you were being tailed? Mr. Chrome looked uncomfortable as he sipped his coffee. His eyes flitted around the diner, and I could tell he was looking for familiar faces. He must have been satisfied with what he saw, because he turned back and pitched his voice low. I told you about the warden's influence, right? Let's just say that I've seen some things that could get me in a lot of trouble if I went blabbing about them. Then why talk to me at all, I asked, very curious about why he would stick his neck out. Because maybe I need to be in trouble. Maybe it's time we paid for what we did that night in October. I spent the next 25 years trying to make amends for that night, but it never seemed like enough. No matter where I went or what I did, I couldn't shake Fraser's face. We did him a disservice, and it's time people knew about it. It's time they knew a lot of things. Some skeletons are hidden under strag view that need to come out, and some aren't even skeletons yet. Still want to hear about it? When I set the tape recorder between us and clicked it on, he grinned, showing me yellow teeth that had seen a lot of coffee and cigarettes in their day. Good. A week later, I saw Frasia with my own eyes. We had a full shift that night. No call-outs, no vacations, so every dorm had two people in it. I usually worked with your grandfather, but the captain had put me in a dorm with Sergeant Caden. I was told later that he had gotten a complaint from the officer he'd put in there the night before. The captain needed someone in there that he was unlikely to sexually harass, and I was elected. I started the paperwork, counted, made small talk, and generally tried to ride out the night. Caden had apologized for what he'd done on the yard by then. He claimed he got a little out of hand and didn't mean to stick me. I had generously accepted it, hinting that the info might be something I'd want to hang on to for later. We had a tentative truce since then, and as the thunder rumbled away in the woods, we settled in for a long, boring night. When the rain started, the lights flickered in the cages above the beds, and the tin roof sounded like there might be a little hail in it. We hadn't had a good storm since a week before, and I remembered wondering if it was going to be as crazy as the one your granddad had told me about. Round about the time the lightning started, the lights went out completely. That was nine, and we sat there with just the emergency lights for company, for an hour before the incident took place. Caden was just finishing telling me a story that was 90% bullshit when someone started screaming on the floor. We shined our lights into the dorm, 
flashing them through the cage bars that surrounded us, and we could both see someone pinned against the wall. He was looking at whoever's back was to us and shuddering all over. The person menacing him was yelling incoherently, and when the lightning peeled overhead, you could see that whoever the other was wasn't quite right. His proportions were wrong, too big, too undefined, and he seemed to move beneath his clothes like a bundle of wires. My daddy had a scarecrow made of old spun-together coat hangers when I was a kid. This fella looked like he had, his clothes vaguely man-shaped, but not in one solid piece. Caden sprang into action, grabbing his stick and telling me to hang tight. He lumbered onto the floor, shouting at the two to separate. The inmate, who was pinned, jerked a little as the other reached for him, and I could swear I could see sparks coming off his skin. He reached out a hand to take the man by the throat, and when he did, he started bucking like someone who's grabbed an electric fence. Caden roared as he came in, bringing his stupid club down on the other. It pulled lamely at the shirt, and I could see that whatever lay beneath was more liquid than solid. When the other turned his face and bellowed at Caden, that was when I saw him. Inmate Frazier's face was lumpy and damaged, his eyes black pits of red rage, and Caden took a step back as it turned and fixed him with its gaze. The club fell with a hollow wooden clump, and Caden began to run as the thing turned away from its target and came after him instead. The inmate that had been pinned, Griggs, his name had been Griggs, crumpled down the wall, still convulsing as he fell. Caden was out the door as the Frasier thing walked jerkily across the floor, and that was when it saw me. His eyes met mine, and I could see nothing but hate, nothing but fear, nothing but uncertainty behind them. He approached me, eyes locked on mine through the glass of the booth, and I felt like a bug under a magnifying glass. People were yelling at him to sit down before the other guards got here, but he ignored them and just kept coming closer and closer to my office. I backed away, trying to put distance between us, but I hit the opposite wall as he came right up to the glass. I could see his deep blue eyes pulsating with deeper energy as he tried to press his face through the wire mesh and glass and right into the station. I tried to push my backside out the other side and into the adjacent sleeping area, but it remained substantial against me. When he hit the glass with his head, cracking it and causing it to ripple like splintered ice, I yelled loud enough to wake the dead. The A-team arrived a few minutes later, and when they did, Frazier was gone. He left nothing but a pile of clothes and the splintered glass in his wake. Gone? Where did he go? Chrome shrugged. Vanished, just like he had in Foxtrot. If I hadn't seen him for myself, I would have never believed it. When I talked to your grandfather about it, he seemed unsure about what he had seen that night, after having some time to think about it. I asked him if he'd seen Frazier too, but now he didn't seem to want to talk about it. He was scared, but the fear for us had just begun. Caden may have escaped the dorm while Frazier was staring at me, but his luck wouldn't last forever. The waitress brought out food then, bacon, eggs, hash browns, and toast, 
and refilled Chromes' coffee again. He let me pick at the food a little before he asked if I wanted him to continue. I was hooked by this point, enraptured by the story and the idea of someone having their revenge from their infirmary bed. I nodded, the recorder still running, and he picked back up again. A week later, things had settled down a little. Caden had taken two nights off, leaving early that night after he'd run straight to the captain's office to tell him about the fight. He had used those two days to convince himself that it was all crap and that no boogeyman Frazier was out to get him. He'd seen something, yes, but it was a trick of the light. Besides, Griggs hadn't even died that night. He'd spent a couple of days in the infirmary with light burns on his chest and neck, but he'd made a full recovery. As the muggy weather stretched on and the sky stayed cloudless, we all prepared for an unreasonably warm autumn. Then the storms came back, and it was a bloodbath. It came up suddenly one night, the first peal of thunder seeming to attract the buckets of rain that followed, and the killings weren't far behind. It happened suddenly and without warning. Four inmates from four different dorms as the worst storm of the year raged out of control. The traffic was always the same. Two inmates fighting, or inmates kicking the door saying someone was fighting. We had to run between Hotel and Echo to Alpha and then back to Hotel, though it was a different quad. All four seemed to have died of a heart attack, their hearts having just stopped beating all of a sudden. They were all deemed as such, but they were seen fighting with other inmates before they died in two cases. We would get to the dorm and find the body lying by their bed or crumpled over in the bathroom with no other combatant in sight. The two from hotel died in their cells, but both cellmates swore they'd seen someone in the cell after lockdown fighting with the victim. That someone couldn't be found, and by the end of the night, we were soaked to the skin and ready to chew nails. Cap was filling out paperwork, trying not to let his fear show. We left that night, the rain showing no signs of stopping. Luckily, however, the lightning took a break, and we had a week of balmy, rainy weather. Made us all wish the heat had been our only concern. I remember my boots being constantly wet for that week, and the general feeling of unease as the idea of another string of heart attacks hung over the compound. A week later, the first week of October, the rain retook a thundery tone, and two inmates died of heart attacks. One of them, a guy named Drell, had been walking to an early morning call-out when he was suddenly set upon by an unknown person. Macklemore, the officer who'd been escorting him, said they had just been rounding the side of Charlie Dorm when someone had come out of the shadows and shoved Macklemore over and jumped on Drell. Drell had screamed, screamed like a pig who's got his leg hung, but as Macklemore grabbed for his radio, it was already too late. Drell's body was still twitching, but his life had fled. Macklemore said the guy had been enormous, six feet at least, but no one was ever found, and no one besides Drell was on the yard at the time. The week after, two more were found dead in their beds after the lights came on, both with burn wounds around their throats. That was when my fellow officers started leaving. Most of them were just smart enough to see the writing on the wall, and they weren't about to get caught up in this bull crap. It was only a matter of time before someone got blamed or an officer got caught up in this nonsense. Caden had already started whispering about what he'd seen, and some of his friends were not real big on getting caught in the crossfire if Frazier came for them. Others were just lazy and simply looking for an excuse to burn vacation or sick leave. All of them were gutless, and it left the shift ragged and undemanded. 
that was how I came to be in the captain's office, helping with paperwork. You see, inmates will always take an opportunity when handed to them. They had picked up on these mysterious killers and decided to run with it. On top of the ten killings committed by our mystery man, we'd had six stabbings, five assault, and found a dozen or so new weapons during a dorm raid. Our captain was beside himself, worrying that his job was history, and we were ragged from running in the rain, which had been falling almost constantly since September had become October. I was sitting with the inmate files and going over them before sending them to the warden. I started comparing them to the two inmates that were killed the first night. Six of them had disciplinary notes in their files from the last six months, and most of them had cited inmate Frazier as the victim. Four had been sent to confinement for fighting or stealing. Two more had been written up for alleged gang activities. I imagined that the others would have some sort of run-in with Frazier as well, though they'd been smart enough to keep it under the radar. I felt myself shudder under my wet uniform, remembering what I'd seen, and thought of Frazier finding a way to tie up loose ends from his infirmary bed. As I made a note on my soggy notebook, I could hear the captain making excuses to the warden on the phone. Ten deaths, multiple injuries, and a lot of man hours used to quell them. I imagined he was up to his ass in alligators over this and it wouldn't take much for them to have his bars over it, his fault or not. When the radio crackled, and the scared voice of Trainee Freck came blaring over it, I thought this might be the straw that breaks the camel's back. I need help! Please help me! Officer down! Repeat! Officer down in Delta Dorm, side two! I need help! Please! Someone help me! We were running before we knew what we were doing. Officer down was one of those phrases that elicits immediate action, if you're any kind of officer. Doesn't matter if you like the guy who's getting his ass beat or not. You go and help, because you'd want him to run if it was you in trouble. I met your grandfather as we both ran across the grass, slipping and sliding in the mud as we tried to stay upright. We buzzed through the doors to side two together, batons in hand and ready for anything. That's when I saw a familiar face slumped over a sink. He was still twitching, his eyes still jittering and dancing in his skull as he convulsed, and I noticed a pair of discarded blues sitting on the floor by his feet. He was pale, his hands gripping his chest as he looked at us like he thought we could throw him a raft in these troubled waters. He was one of the officers who had gone to the rec yard with Caden. Officer Miles was receiving his comeuppance for his hand in Frazier's beating, but I wasn't going to let one of my own get caught up in an inmate's revenge fantasy. Your grandfather and I were on him in a second. He was still breathing, but his heart was fluttering in his chest like a caged bird. We carried him between us, the rain sheeting down as we drug him to medical. Miles was twitching like a landed trout, and his feet kept kicking the ground like he was trying to trip us. We nearly dropped him a few times, and as we came by the captain's office, a few others came out to help us. They had been grouping up to go to Delta Dorm, and now that they saw what was waiting for them, they came out to help us drag him to medical. We were all completely soaked by the time we got there, and Miles had stopped gasping and started wheezing. The nurses took him from us and wheeled him to the back, giving him something to get his heart back on track and calling the hospital to get a bed ready for him. We left him in their capable hands, but I couldn't help but look through the glass to Frazier in his infirmary bed. His head was bandaged, his eyes blackened, and he was staring at the ceiling as he lay there. His face, however, wore the most cherubic grin I'd ever seen on a grown man, 
It was hard to believe a man who smiled like that could have been doing what he was doing. I went down to Delta Dorm after that to ask Freck what he'd seen. To say the kid was shaken would have been an understatement. I found him sitting in one of the big uncomfortable metal chairs we kept in the office, knees to his chest as he breathed like he was having a panic attack. He jumped when I touched his shoulder, not even hearing me come in. The sight of someone like me, a real officer, seemed to calm him. I took a seat across from him and, much as you're doing here, started making mental notes for later. He told me that Miles had been attacked by an inmate that had melted into clothes once he was done. He was out doing a walkthrough, making sure everyone was asleep, and he was coming back through the bathroom to get back to the station when something stepped out of a toilet stall and grabbed him. He grabbed him by the shoulders and his hands kind of glowed. I don't know. I was beating on the glass and yelling at him to stop. Miles started convulsing and twitching like he was being electrocuted. That's when I started yelling over the radio, telling people to come help. He pushed him against the sink. Miles jittered and shaking, and then you and Officer Grimes came bursting in, and he just melted. The kid looked pretty rattled, and I took his post and let him go home. Freck went on to become a major, a freaking major, but I always remembered him as that scared-as-shit T.A., who nearly pissed his pants in Delta Dorm. Just goes to show you. He finished another coffee, and I began to smell lunch cooking from the kitchen. Was it lunchtime already? It had just been morning time. How long had I been sitting here, listening to this man tell me about a particular stretch of 1985? My phone vibrated in my pocket, freeing me from my trance, and I pulled it out to check my messages. My stomach dropped, and I was out of the booth in a second. I, I gotta go. Chrome looked worried. Everything okay? My mom's at the hospital with my grandpa. Somebody tried to run him off the road. You're still here. I thought you might be. Thanks for joining me for tonight's story. If your insatiable appetite for horror knows no bounds, might I suggest one of our playlists, or one of our previous stories in the archive? There should be one appearing at the end of the story any minute now. And of course, if you're not subscribed, why not go ahead and hit that subscribe button? Maybe hit that notification bell, so you don't miss any of the spooky things that we do here. If you prefer your horror a little more analog, you can always pick up one of my books. There's a link below to my latest, and it'll take you to all the great things that I've posted on Amazon. For my book lovers in the audience, I always suggest coming on down to Patreon, so you can become part of my ghostly reader tier and get a book anytime I write one, which is usually about twice a year. Speaking of my patrons, let's go ahead and thank them, shall we? Thanks to Unicorn Hollow for being our spooky ghost contributor. Thanks to Janet for being our Spooky Skeleton tier contributor. And thanks to Hi Stacy, Winter, Zoronin, Emily Coltsfoot, Stephanie Carrington, Marianne Schuler, Tyler Parker, and Jennifer Damron for being our Ghostly Reader tier contributors. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you think you might like to support the show in a more monetary fashion, come on down to Patreon. I have many tiers. I think you'll find one that'll suit you best. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague. Signing off, have a wonderful evening.